love the space community. I think most bass players are, are very open people uh, and we're willing to share. And, you know, we talked about, I like to s sit around at night and watch bass videos. Where to start with today's guest, one of the biggest names in jazz bass and such a fascinating person and great human being. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with John Goldsby. Round three, at least, I think, John. I'm not sure exactly. We're talking today about his most recent course for Discoverable Bass, Tell Your Story, all about jazz bass soloing. We talk about that, what it's like filming these courses for Discover Double Bass, which I did between the last time I had John on the show and now John's latest album segment, the pandemic in general and how that's been, this very cool live streamed event with his trio through the WDR Big Band. That's all linked up to in the show notes. Definitely check out the course and everything John's up to. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them later, but let's dig into our conversation with John John Goldsby. How's it going, John? <laughs> How are Thanks, you, Jason? Good. How are you, stranger? Good to see you. <laughs> you. <laughs> shaken. Uh, just started the day, you know? What a year. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, it uh, things things are good. You know, we've it's been getting um it's been weirdly nice here in San Francisco. It was like 75 degrees and sunny the last couple of days, which is, you know, California is usually pretty nice, but that's unusual even for February. So, I've been tr trying to stay out of the sun. I'm getting a little bit of a sunburn in mid-February, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, actually here in Cologne, it's the same. It's uh up to yeah 20 centigrades which is almost 70 degrees fahrenheit so we're uh experiencing some kind of weird global warming early spring thing going on here wow is is that that has that's pretty unusual right for this time of year yeah usually the weather here is like seattle or something it's just you know the the winter is you know four months of of rain and 35 degrees or something but mm -hmm. usually but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was, I, you know, I, I did that Discover Double Bass course. I was trying to remember the last time we chatted. It was maybe four or five months before I did that. I want to say like 2019, sometime like that. And okay. I remember booking the ticket to Leeds and everything. And it was the cheapest flight I've ever gotten to Europe. And I thought, why is it so cheap? And then I thought, oh, Leeds in January, maybe not a <laughs> vacation destination, right? <laughs> exactly. How did that work out for you? It worked out great. I mean, I, I talk about squeaking in under the wire. That was my last international trip for who knows how long. You know, I went over there the end of January into early February. And then I came back here and I did, had like four four more weeks of just all over the place here in the States. And now thinking a, a year back, it's like for me, it's kind of like watching the early scenes of a disaster movie. Like, you know what's about to happen. <laughs> but like at this point, I think I was in Texas for the their music educator conference and just yucking it up. And then I went to Pittsburgh and then uh, beginning of March, I came here and my base in the corner hasn't left this place in like a year. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love your course. It's great. It's uh... I, I appreciate it. You were a major influence. I went through and watched everything that you had up on the site and was just thinking like, how do you put one of these things together? Cause it's kind of a big, it feels like a big responsibility. Maybe that's blowing it up too much. But if I think like, okay, I want to put this down once and have people go back to it time and time again, it it takes some time to think through all this stuff. And I know you've done, you're no stranger to online courses, but it's it was a it was a fun experience, interesting experience. But it was I just sort of felt this pressure, internal pressure to get it right. I guess. Yeah, and there's that pressure when you're there recording to think okay, is this good enough? Is it good enough to get the point across? Because it's, you know, it, maybe it's not good enough if you're thinking, oh, th th this should be the, uh, you know, the best performance I've ever done. But, mm -hmm. you know, if it's good enough to get the point across, I think that's the, uh, and show us a standard of excellence, then that's that's what we're going for, I guess. 
Yeah. Did, did I tell you about that I filmed a course before this is several double base course? Did I ever tell you about my course that never was released to the public? I'm uh, okay. That got seized by the FBI. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's still under wraps, right? It never, it's, it's never, I have one clip of me appearing in literally a ball of fire. There's, I was, I did this children, they were filming this set of children's videos. And so I just appear in this poof of poof of fire and, and they say, it's Jason. And then I play a little bit of music. And that's the only uh, artifact I've ever seen from that course. So, yeah. You put that on Facebook, right? At some point. Didn't you I put would... the... Yes. Fire video. Yeah. Exactly. Well, because I was thinking about I was I, it was right before I went to the UK to film that, and I thought, what the heck ever happened to that course? So I started I started poking around, and the only thing I could find was that you know one minute video. So who knows? Someday it'll surface on so, in some sort of other language subtitled, you know, somewhere. So. <laughs> wow. Well, I can't. So you went to the UK for this latest one, right? The to film it. Right. There was a. a sort of a window back in, uh, I guess it was August, 2019. No, 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 August, 2020, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a year off, uh, <laughs> August, 2020, uh, where, the, you know, we had been through the first lockdown, the UK had been through their first lockdown and then it was summer and the government sort of said, well, maybe it's not that bad, you know, mm -hmm. people can still travel and this and that. And we thought about it because a lot of people were not traveling and it wasn't maybe the, the smartest thing to do, but we, you know, max, masked up and uh, got on the little puddle jumper and flew up to Manchester mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, did two courses in a week and uh, very intense, but, you know, uh, Jeff had his great team there and we got everything down and the studio was nice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that was in August, 2020. Wow. You squeezed in right between all the lockdowns to do everything. You know, it's funny. I was talking to Jeff about it and in a way what he does is like kind of a, one of the better activities for socially distanced stuff, right? Cause it's just you and a few other people, you know, then you could, you're right. kind of spread out anyway. It's not like you're on stage with 30 other people. So I'm um, making online courses, uh, probably one of the, one of the better activities to be doing during a pandemic, probably exactly. <laughs> bass players seem to like them. I mean, I, I like them. I, you know, my wife makes fun of me because, you know, we'll watch a TV show at night and then, she says, well, I'm going to go, go read. And then I start watching bass videos <laughs> you know, <laughs> on, on our TV screen, you know, and she always makes fun of me like, okay, you go watch your bass videos and I'm going to read some literature. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, John, we, we do, we have very similar evening activities. That is, that is very close to what I, <laughs> what I do too. I'm, I'm sort of addicted to the, the high quality of what Jeff has been doing recently. It's kind of hard for me to like, it, it, what, what a cool experience. And you were in uh, the Jeff had been, you weren't the first person he put courses out for once he started stepping up and inviting other people, but you've, you've had several, I mean, that team has really got their game going. Their, their video course creation game is strong. Cause I think that they were talking to me and I was number 15 or 16 in terms of the courses they had done together. So they're, right. they're seasoned pros at putting together these, these things. Yeah. They're, they're fantastic. And they that that puts a, a lot of pressure on us because they can basically work as fast as we can you know record a chapter or whatever and if you think oh well i need to go back and re-record that or i need to say that again then that's all on you <laughs> uh, yeah well how do you how have you i probably asked this before so forgive me but like how do you plan for one of these courses because i have come up with my own system i tried something for that course that got seized by the fbi and then i perfected it and so i have this whole thing using different apps on my ipad and like i had a little morning routine going through what i was going to talk about but i mean you've done this sort of this is multiple courses with discoverable base now at this point and then you've done projects like that before like what how do you put one of these things together on your end uh well i it's it's a lot of mental preparation of just thinking what do i want to communicate uh what do i think first of all people should know and what are they going to find interesting enough to buy a course or or tune into the the teaser videos what's what's really interesting to people um and what can i do that's 
maybe my own perspective on bass technique or, you know, musical aspects. So I start making lists of, uh, you know, well, I should focus on these techniques, but maybe I should present these types of tunes or these types of other bass players. Like the new course uh, is called Tell Your Story. It's basically uh, how to play improvised bass solos in a jazz context, starting with sort of simple solos and then moving up to more complex solos. Um, so yeah, I, I, I try and organize that on paper and then make it into little lesson plans for myself. And then I start playing through all this material, which is very humbling <laughs> <laughs> when I'm playing through some of these easy exercises and I think, well, that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, thinking, well, why, you know, I mean, it's a great learning experience for me, but it's also something, it's like I would go into a private lesson with someone and say, okay, let's work on, you know, long tones or scales, or let's look at the, or this, you know, our geo idea um, and just, trying to do things step by step. So there's a, it's challenging, but also presented in little bite-sized pieces that people can work on maybe one chapter a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine and six time Grammy winning jazz bassist and former Contra Bass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. People have been saying such great things about my course with Discover Double Bass Beginners Classical Bass. Here is Nicholas Walker, professor of double bass at Ithaca College and past president of the International Society of Basses. Nicholas writes, Jason draws from this vast network with his contagious enthusiasm and love of learning. Presented through the beautifully organized and easily accessible framework of Discover Double Bass, this is a terrific learning experience for any beginner as well as a great model for any new teacher. I am blushing, Nicholas. Thank you so much. I'm just so thrilled with how this course came out. Jeff Chalmers and the whole team at Discover Double Bass are so professional. It was such a great experience, and it was the best representation of what I would love to take every single beginner through in terms of format and presentation, and I'm just, I'm just so happy that it's out there. You can learn more. We've got a link in the show notes, or you can just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I had a similar process. I had all these bullet points, and I would then like practice out loud and I realized oh this idea is terrible and then I would try to get and I I, I don't do much teaching uh, these days but I've had these two public high school students here in San Francisco for the last few years and so they were my guinea pigs I would say hey let me try this and then it would work or it wouldn't work or I would ask them I was like does this make sense and so I have still on my iPad here it's like discovered a little base beginner course version six you know I would like nuke and pave and start it all over again and try you know and I took that first outline uh, from that FBI sees course and I I'm always unhappy with my, my latest project so I basically like started from scratch again and went through but it was it was it was it's interesting and and it's similar my perspective it's similar but it's also different from teaching a student because you have the student come in and they're at wherever they're at and you're working on what they're interested in but, but like putting this thing together and just like talking to this camera lens and trying to make it uh, applicable for as you know as broad a, a market as as would be interested that topic it's a it's a unique challenge I, it was, I, I i learned a lot just like you were saying i think i'm a better it helped me clarify my thinking about a lot of things but it was it was not an easy task for me right and there's a lot of it, i i found that i needed to slow down a lot of times and just explain or over explain exactly how i do something of which finger goes where and when do I make the shift and how do I play this or, you know, let's do that in slow motion. Um, those kinds of things, which if you're with a private student, you can kind of judge if they're 
maybe they're advanced way beyond that, but, or maybe they're not. I, I found that most people can benefit from slowing things way down. And uh, like you say, figuring out, you know, how it is you do a certain technique well, you you strike me as, as you're just the way you deliver things. You have just this sort of authority to the you know in, in a good way to the way you describe concepts. I have this problem that I'm I'm like this over caffeinated chipmunk, and so I'm trying to I'm trying to I I really had to like focus on taking things a little bit slower, not quite so much coffee in the morning and just <laughs> kind, of, kind of try to try to, you know, think about not, you know, not going off on tangents and, and all that sort of thing. But but bravo on this. I've, I've watched through a decent chunk of it. And it's just really cool because there's there's material out there for developing bass solos, but there's not a ton of it, I, at least in my like scan or an organized way. There's a lot more for walking bass lines, I think, but it's, it's, there's not like, what have you sent people to in the past? If for like resources for developing bass solos, are there any standby books for you or anything that you've recommended in the past? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's funny territory because a bass solo is always something that, you know, 95% of the time or more, we're playing ensemble. We're playing bass lines and the bass solo, you know, it, it comes. It's like the joke after the drum stop, then the bass solo starts, you know, oh, watch out. Um, but so most, a lot of bass players, especially uh, inexperienced bass players, beginning players, have no idea they think when the bass solo comes then they have to start playing all kinds of fast stuff and my concept that i've developed over the years is the bass solo is uh an organic part of the structure of the song it's just pretty much like the bass line except you don't have to play a continuous uh you know through composed uh, functional bass line. You can play the upper tones of the harmony. You can leave a lot of space. You can play rhythms. You can play different things. So you're just describing the harmony uh, in a different way, but it's the same harmony. So that's how I try and have people shift their thinking about this, because I think a lot of the books, you ask about books, they say, okay, in order to play bass solos, you need to learn this lick and then learn this lick and then learn this pattern, and then you go plug all those patterns into the, the song you're working on, which that's one way to practice it, but I, I don't think the great soloists practice that way. I think they had a musical sense and they, they played their bass lines, and then when it came to the solo, they, they just heard the upper part of the harmony or the melodic part. So, in, in this course, uh, Tell Your Story, I start out with Autumn Leaves, you know, which is a pretty bass friendly melody in G minor and uh, just worked on target notes. So uh, targeting certain key chord tones, just like we would play target notes on the roots if we were playing a bass line, root, two, three, four, root, two, three, four, root. So with the target notes, then I, have people playing, okay, th third, two, three, four, seventh, two, three, or seventh, two, three, four, third, two, three, four, seventh, uh, and just targeting the pretty notes up at, top, up at the top of the chord. Uh, so that's the way I start rather than, okay, let's learn a bunch of licks and patterns and plug those in. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to offer with the course is to always relate back to, uh, great bass soloists so you know there's there's a transcription of paul chambers there's a transcription of scott lafaro uh just so we you know see how these players approach soloing on the bass it wasn't always just licks even though you can take some licks from from their solos what they improvised and and work on those as little etude type uh exercises it's such a great medium for teaching something like this. It's this rich medium because you get the video, you've got the transcriptions, and then uh, D Jeff, whoever he has do the transcriptions, I'm assuming he had the same person do yours. They're like, 
excellent you know and so and and time stamps you can go back and forth and just having this like super high quality video they've got the 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 gimbal or the ronin you know the camera coming in where we needed it's such a cool experience and and i you know i'm such an amateur jazz player i i but i still if i'm hearing a tune and I, all of a sudden i just hear that hi hat and i know it's bass solo time i just freeze up and you know i remember back in northwestern in college you know the the first couple solos i took it was like a disaster and then i went and learned a bunch of licks and then i was just this diarrhea of licks you know playing and so the the, the having the play along examples that that and having just everything you, you can listen to it you can watch it you can see it you can go back and forth it's a particularly well suited medium for teaching well anything i guess but you know it's it i i um i know that i am getting more out of going through lessons on your course than if i was just like paging through a book like i did back in the 90s right sure yeah it's really hard to learn well any type of musical thing but improvisation is very hard to learn how to improvise from a book <laughs> and, and most you know the things I, I another thing i've realized about books is that you can really describe the the theory and the harmony and in a book and make a bunch of rules about theory and harmony but you can't do that with the rhythm mm -hmm. the feeling of improvising and the feeling of playing with a rhythm section you have to hear that even if you write it down on paper and you say, well, this is a triplety swing feel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, you know, what does that even mean? You know, if you, but if you hear it, it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's Ray Brown playing a triplet. I, you know, maybe I can emulate that or imitate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the rhythmic thing is, is what's really great about these courses that you can, uh, yeah, like you say, hear it, see it, re repeat it, you know, go back. And uh, the transcriptions are immaculate. I don't, I, I haven't asked Jeff who does the transcriptions, but I've said, please tell them, <laughs> tell them this is a great job. You know? Yeah, I, I believe it's the same person who's done them all. And, and it's, it's just, it's great to see um, all of that laid out like that. I, I, um, I, I was, you, how do you, uh, do you go in with a bunch of notes to the actual when you were actually filming these things or are you kind of riff? I mean, you said you planned ahead of time, but like once you actually get in there, how uh, do you know exactly what you're going to say for each one of these lessons that you do? I'm just kind of asking selfishly, just, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't write it out, mm -hmm. but I, I might have some key bullet points that I want to hit. Mm -hmm. And then I just uh, it's almost like I'm. I'm talking to a, a private student who's just kind of standing there, not saying anything. <laughs> so, so I just keep going and going and going. You know, I'll, I'll have dress rehearsals with myself and say, okay, I'm going to do these five lessons and play through them. Uh, as I said, that's humbling. And then, you know, what am I going to say here after I play through that part? What am I going to say through, say at this po point? Um, but I, I don't write everything out like a script. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the coolest things about this piece of software, there's so many things, but one of them is their popover option. And it has sped up things so much for me when I'm working in scores. Here's senior product manager Daniel Spreadbury on how popover mode works. There's like hundreds of notations that you might want to create and trying to remember what to type, you know, oh, is it command shift alt, you know, Vulcan death grip seven <laughs> for this particular notation. But the nice thing about a popover is all you have to remember is the letter of the thing you want to create. So D for dynamics, T for tempo, M for meter, K for key signature. It might seem like a simple thing, but you would not believe how much that has sped up my workflow. And I'm not even really a composer. I do a lot of arrangements. I do a lot of exercises, but it has taken my workflow probably at least up to five times faster. Just that one mode. I can't say enough good things about Dorico. I love it. I use it every single day. There's a free version, Dorico SE, that you can download that lets you do practically everything for up to two 
stabs. So check it out. Dorco.com will take you to their page on Steinberg's website. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. My daily companion for practicing is the app Modacity. I love it so much. And the interface is so simple. You open it up and you see a microphone and a timer. And here is Modacity founder Mark Gelfel on why you see that in the interface. It comes down to practice efficiency. And practice efficiency, the way that I think about it, is an equation with three different variables. One of them is learning milestones, one of them is retention, and the other is time. I define practice efficiency as learning milestones times retention divided by time spent. Modacity has helped my practicing so much and so many other people I know. You can learn more at modacity.co and visit our site for a special offer on lifetime access to this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. Trying to figure out how how is this week going to go? Because like you, I filmed two courses in one week. And I've, I've never really done that in my life. Just like take an entire week off and just film a video course. You've probably done projects closer to that. And so I, I, I had this whole morning routine. I get up and we may have even stayed at the same hotel. You know, I, I, it's likely. Um, and I went down and had breakfast. And then I went for a like a 30-minute walk and kind of collected my thoughts, looked at the notes, walked in there. And it was really interesting to just just focus on that. I'm so glad that I, I went over there and I wasn't trying to film something, you know, on my own with a bunch of other projects. It was fun to be able to focus. But it is so interesting to do something that's teaching, but yeah, like a, a student that says nothing. You know, it's kind of funny to like for a week, you know, just like talk to these lenses or this one lens, I guess, and just not get anything back. And I was so glad that you gave me such great advice, by the way. we were. I remember talking to you, it must have been in 2019, about Jeff's bass and how it played and everything you said is like exactly the case. You know, it's this really warm bass. I had this moment. Um, he has these great, or at least he did, these great spiracores on, I think, and and really great sound. Those are not usually the strings I choose to bow on, but he had just had Joe Conyers from the Philadelphia Orchestra over, and he did his whole course on those spiracores. And Jeff said, do you want me to change the strings? I thought, well, if Joe did this orchestral course on these strings, I, I feel like I would be such a wimp to not do it. And, and it's funny because the spiral cores, like I, I use strings that are much more, um, the dampening agent is much greater that, you know, and so they're just easier to bow, but I, I got settled in on it. And then when I listen back to the results, I'm so glad that I just went with that because the tone was, was great. So I just, I want to thank you so much because you made me feel really, um, and so did Jeff and everybody, but I, but you gave me a lot of things to think about. It was, it was really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, yeah, his bass is great. You know, it's not a pedi pedigree bass, but somehow it's just one of those basses that it's pretty easy to play. It's warm and it's it's very friendly. So when you start playing it, you think, oh, yeah, I can play all my stuff on this instrument. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I had this great moment with Jeff. I think it's the only time we both cracked up laughing, filming this, but I was trying to show how to put the case on the bass. And Jeff has this case that's like particularly finicky, like it, it, unless you zip it a certain way. And, but I thought, okay, beginner course, we should, we should, you know, cover that. And, and I just, there's something about like trying to figure out how to bring Jeff onto the, into the camera. It just made, it, it made for hilarity. And then Jeff was thinking about like rising up from the bottom of the frame or something like that. <laughs> so that was fun and the, the, the did he, now you filmed these this course and i guess you've got one more coming up from this uh, uh did you you filmed the same studio you did prior right the was it the same place uh, no this, this was a new studio the oh. uh what was let me see the Clockworks was the first studio that I did the first mm -hmm. two courses in, and that was in Leeds. And then this studio is in Manchester. It's called uh, 88 Hertz. Okay. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you never did. You, so you haven't done it. You never, there's this 80 really hertz. 80 Hertz. That's what it's called. Oh, 80 Hertz. Okay. Oh, that's a good name. Um, the, uh, I filmed in that, uh, this old church that's been converted into uh, that many, uh, I think, I think Katie Thoreau did her course in there. I think it's called the nave or something like that. If I remember. I, I did some solo tunes in there. <gasps> right. Okay. Right. Cause I was, I was, con okay. That's what, cause I thought I saw you in there, but okay. So, okay. Okay. Very cool. So you've been in that space too. That space is acoustically great for bass um 
And it was funny to fly, you know, all the way from here on the West Coast over to, to Leeds and walk in. And then I like saw this lamp that I've seen in the back of all of these courses. So, but that, that was an incredible space too. It's just all around. Um, what, like, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it being done any more professionally, I guess. I don't know. That might be a weird thing to say, but just everything about the experience and the planning and the filming, it's like, who has a, a film crew that's that well versed in like filming double days of all things, you know, is just particularly cool um, to just, just from, from my perspective, but then also like seeing what everybody's done and what you've done. It's, it's, I, I can't imagine in my mind. I, I mean, I guess w technology will continue to evolve and somehow we'll get even better video, but, but, it's it's like the production quality is just so high on on these things. It's it's just remarkable to me. Yeah, as you know, I work at the WDR studio in here in Cologne, so we do a lot of videos. But like you say, the, the Discover Double Bass is run by Jeff Chalmers, a bass player who knows exactly what you need to film when you're shooting bass, and and his crew has done all these lessons now all these uh, packages and uh yeah everybody just knows what to do when you know a bass player starts playing and where do you point which camera and what's important and yeah here's here's a question you may have thought about since you've done these i i i see all this stuff that jeff has done and i look around and think well surely this must be happening for other instruments and kind of a little bit but not to the extent that i that certainly like i look like where's the discover trumpet or discover french horn or something like why do you and maybe i'm, I'm just biased because i live in the bass world but it strikes me that like 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 why hasn't this or and and i know that there are piano you know some piano and other other instrumentalists have built up things that are similar but it's interesting to me why the bass community is so into learning in this way that might be a horrible question but have you have you thought about that at all is am i biased or is there something in the nature of bass players that just makes us want to soak up information that's your bias in a good way <laughs> <laughs> no uh yeah i think bass players uh just have we love this bass community i think most bass players are, are very open people uh and we're willing to share and you know, we talked about, I like to s sit around at night and watch bass videos. Um, but I actually suggested to Jeff, I said, well, you know, you should do discover jazz saxophone and discover trumpet. And, you know, and I think the thought has crossed his mind, but also the amount of work and, and uh, cracking into uh, cracking a new market is uh, intimidating. I just don't know if saxophone players and trumpet players. And uh, I have noticed that trombone players seem to have a similar community to bass players, maybe because it's more of an underdog instrument or it's not so competitive. It's more of a supportive uh, community that they have. Yeah, and I found the same with tuba too. It seems like the the bass, well, the, those instruments that we all kind of sit near each other in orchestra too. They they seem to be a little more into that community thing. There's the old line: violinists have competitions, bass players have conventions, and I think there's <laughs> there's 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 some truth to that for sure in my experience. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, there are all kinds of piano videos on the market, and and some of them are really good and some i've seen are just i don't know the good piano players sort of showing off their chops mm -hmm. um there's something maybe about the the pedagogy of the bass is maybe a little bit more in development. That might be a, the wrong way to put it, but we're, we're, you know, you go back 50 years, people are playing on gut strings, 60, 70 years at this point, whatever. People are playing on gut strings. Uh, just things have evolved a lot. And the, just the, the pace of, you know, bass design, getting around the instrument, uh, it just seems like maybe the, that. And then the fact that it's so non-standardized, you know, we play in so many genres we play basses that are so many different shapes. We stand, we sit, we play German bow, we play French bow, you know, we play with our strings real low, our strings up high. I know there's variation in other instruments too, and particularly like trombonists like to geek out and tubists like to geek out, but, but maybe there's something about the non-standardization that just, you know, gets us all excited about learning about what's happening. I, I think that's, that gets to the core of the, 
situation because uh, at, at least in the jazz story, uh, you know, e even from the beginning in the 20s and, and 30s, you had these great trumpet players and saxophone players, Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young, and then Charlie Parker came along. So, he, you know, in the 40s already, the level of saxophone playing and trumpet playing was super high. It was, you know, you can't find many players today who can play on that level. It was already the bar was set really high, but the bass was still developing. Uh, you know, there were good ensemble bass players back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, but the soloists in the jazz world didn't really, uh, you know, start to shine until the 40s, 50s, into the 60s. And then the classical players, it seemed like the, the jazz players sort of became aware of the classical players and then also the influence from electric bass. So in the 70s and 80s onward, there was sort of a, this huge uh, adrenaline shot for, for the bass community. You know, well, you, you can play double bass. Well, can you play Bottasini? Well, no, not really. Well, can you play rhythm changes on the double bass? Well, may, no, not really. Well, can you play funk bass on the electric bass? You know, everything was uh, kind of, the bar was getting higher and higher. And there's so many eclectic bass players who play all different styles. I think the bass is, the, the possibilities are still expanding for the, for the bass players. Whereas for trumpet players or saxophone players, there's they're of course amazing players out there performing but the style and what they play is still you know was already established 50 60 years ago you know just the technical part of it but base the base world is sort of still wide open mm -hmm. yeah no i hear you 100 percent. could you imagine starting the bass or any instrument right now if you were coming up in this youtube era with all that like like if i you know i grew up in sioux falls south dakota uh to, you know I, I just think what if i could give young jason like like if i had gone through your course you know like i don't even know if there were i could probably count on one hand the number of jazz bass players in the entire state you know so so my my i just I had a very limited pool of people to to be around but like if you could if you could soak in information like what's out there now and do it in the right way i just i, I it'll be so interesting to see 10 years down the road 20 years down the road where people and i get i get emails all the time from people from all over the you know I'm, i live in uruguay and i'm going through all these videos and i have all these questions and i'm learning you know and, and just to to the richness of what you get in in well, i mean you, you can just sit on youtube and absorb a lot but the organization in a course like like what you just put out with discoverable base you know just like being able to soak all that in and go back to it no matter where you are in the world as long as you got a connection it's it's just incredible to me to think about how learning is changing just as a result of, of access to these technologies. Yeah, YouTube has been a huge game changer. Because like you say, the, a bass player in Uruguay or, or Bolivia or wherever in India, I, you know, I've, I've had contact over the past year from a, with a young bass player uh, from Delhi. And he says... He's the only bass player in Delhi, which is a, a city of, I, I don't know, had 20 million people. And he's the only jazz bass player and he built his own bass. <laughs> and he's working and he wants to, you know, come to the, go to the States and study. And, you know, he's, he's a good guy. Um, but, you know, all these people have become aware of the different styles of music through YouTube and through these bass videos and music videos. And a, a lot of them are sitting in their bedrooms trying to learn this stuff and imitate this stuff. So uh, the thing I suggest to students is to find one or two or three things that you really love, whatever it is, and try and master those things. You know, find out, you know, if you like this song from this recording, you know, figure out who's playing, what are they doing? Uh, can you play along with that? Or what do you need to practice in order to play along with that? And just start small, because I think that's the problem with YouTube is that they're, as you know, you can 
kill three hours just going from one video to another to another. And it's all, or a lot of it's really great and some of it's not so great, but it's, um, it's important to, to focus on, well, what is it that touches us or moves us? And, you know, what can we do, even if we're just starting out on an instrument, what can we master on a small level to become a little bit better as a musician? Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the beauty of, this, of having some sort of curation, you know, or some sort of organization like going through a course. And I like, it sounds like, like you, I spend a lot of time drifting through YouTube, watching videos. And I, of course, it's like, I watch some bass videos and then all of a sudden I'm watching a video on pa politics in Pakistan. And then I'm going here and there. And it's, it's, it's a quite different experience from like going through and like go, taking a transcription and working through it in an organized way. But it is, it is just remarkable. And I think how, how quickly this has all evolved. You know, I put out a series of videos on YouTube in 2006 with a friend of mine from the Lyric Opera. I had my two megapixel Canon Pixma. I turned it on and it's like, you know, shh, there's all this fuzz in the background. And the, the first video of that, I think it's gotten 300,000 views at this point I had to put it out in a series of 10 videos because you could only upload 10 minutes to YouTube at the time and it's just incredible to think how just that has evolved you know uh, let, let alone everything else that 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 is that has popped up on our radar but it's the it's just so cool how this like you're kind of communicating with this bass player in Delhi the only bass player in Delhi <laughs> it's like crazy I was just on the line with a bassist in Lebanon I interviewed him for the podcast and I'm just thinking how cool is that well like you and I, John, we're sitting here, you're in Germany, I'm out on the West Coast, and it was just crazy to, to talk to this guy, and, and it just made the world feel so small, like, what's it like in Lebanon right now? You know, he was talking about the Beirut explosion, and what he's a jazz bassist, what's the jazz scene in Lebanon like? And he's, you know kind of grim is it was kind of the the summary of that but it's just it's incredible to think how what what you're doing what folks are doing how how it can permeate the world in a way that just never has before yeah i think it's for us it's a positive development because the the level and and the experimentation and the standard is going to get higher and higher when i was coming up you know we, we had to buy lps and they cost at that time, $5, $6, $7, which was a lot of money. And, you know, I started building my collection. First, I, I was a rock and roll guy. So I had a few rock records, but then I started buying jazz records. Uh, but I, you know, when I was starting out, I only had about 10 records, LPs. And that was, you know, every month or every couple of months, I would buy one or two more LPs. But I would listen to those LPs you know, five times a day, every day. And uh, that put that sound in my ear. So that was uh, in a way like the YouTube experience, it's too massive to really learn any one thing really well. But like with the uh, Discover Double Bass courses, you can, if you're going through the course, like you say, you repeat something, you go back and listen again, you repeat it again. And uh, that's the, the path to mastery, but um, I think you and I share a common, you know, I grew up in Louisville, so uh, it also was not a music mecca, even though we had, you know, a nice orchestra and some jazz players around town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, you know, the, the, um, it's always interesting to me how somebody who does something predominantly online like Jeff Chalmers tries to make a physical manifestation of what they do. You know, he I have in my in my place somewhere here a playing card of you. You know, Jeff Chalmers put together these these essentially, you know, like like a baseball card with the statistics. And it's so fun to me to see something that is an, a, an a idea online then have a physical manifestation. I think that's so interesting. You know, I've got like like magnets and stuff for the podcast and it's this sort of funny to me and, and I, I can't help but thinking about like you know you're talking about the LPs and there there is something I, I'm nostalgic like I came up at the, the very end of LPs and then into the CDs and 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 I had my Gary Carr LP and I, I I remember working at the Northwestern University Music Library and they had this entire jazz collection spanning the entire back wall of the entire place thousands of thousands and I remember just walking and pulling these albums out and looking at the back and you know now I listen to everything on my iPhone and I 
I, I, you know, if someone sends me a CD, I just have to rip it and get onto my iPhone because I, I, I only have one CD player and that's to get it into the computer. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it, it's, there are so many things that are lost when you don't have that physical manifestation like the side people on the gig. You know, it's so, it's so, there, and I was talking to Linda O not too long ago and, and she was talking about how she and her husband have been developing this sort of physical, um, it's like a, a folio you can get that, that that it sends to you and it's got like a digital download code, but then you unfold it and it's kind of like a little mini poster with all the information. So it's like, I love the access we have. YouTube, discoverable bass for us bass players and all this, but but I I do... Um, I, you know, a part of me, maybe it's just because of my age or whatever, a part of me misses that sort of physical nature of opening up the liner notes and looking through and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Speaking of, of albums and CDs, I, I recently put out a new album called Segment. Uh, but I, if it were up to me, I would probably only release it digitally because I'm I'm totally into the digital world and and like you say the cd if i get a cd then i just put it on my computer it's in the 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 library here at home i can listen to it uh but uh i did press cds for segment also uh but then i made a little you know i had to try to do it slick i released three eps with some extra tracks and then i released the cd afterwards so the people who really want the the physical feeling of holding the CD, uh, have that option. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's good. I think it's good. And especially once we get a little more back to normal and you're actually at an event, there's something nice. And some people just want a physical, you know, I put out a book, I put out a couple books, but maybe like 10 years ago, I'm, I'm thinking back to, or maybe this one was more recent, but I, I did, a, I did, I, yeah, I was pushing it digitally, but several friends were like, look, can I get the physical book? I just want a book. I want to have it. I want to hold it. I want to take a photo of it. So I, I get, I get that. But have you made the jump in terms of sheet music? Are you still, uh, are you, uh, I, I decided about four years ago, I was going to try to do everything on my iPad if at all possible. Now that's not true. If I'm like subbing in the San Francisco symphony, I'm not going to be a weirdo and try to, you know, I'm reading off paper, but how are you just in terms of, uh, actual sheet music? Have you made that leap into like doing most things digitally or are you, do you still prefer the the paper because like we're talking about i do like writing on the music and underlining and all that kind of stuff no i've i've changed to four score on the ipad that that's for like all the little jazz gigs and things like that when i work with the wdr big band of course they have a uh archive a librarian they print everything out you know on these super big sheets uh, you know, easy to see if, if you make a mistake, it's your fault, not the music's fault. <laughs> you know, there's just those big sheets of, uh, orchestra type, uh, paper. But, uh, so with the big band, I'm, I'm, wor I'm still working on paper, but when I go to any kind of little gig, I, I put everything on the iPad and a playlist folder or whatever you call it. A, and, and then, you know, I have the Bluetooth foot pedal, which takes some getting used to, yeah, it's amazing how much it takes. It, it, I still have to really think about it on a gig. I have to be, I, I, and I think like it gives me a whole new respect for pianists. I already had respect, but I think I think like wow, I'm focusing so much on like where's the foot pedal, you know? Oh, it's a little too far away from me. Oh no, I got to make the. But it seems like four score is that the perfect thing for a jazz musician because that set list feature it just it's it's like it, it it's got to just totally change the game. Right. I played a concert with it last week though. And, uh, you know, every, everything was totally fine except for one tune where I had, I, you know, I went, you know, stepped on the pedal for page two and it went to the tune, the previous tune, you know, so I'm, you know, I step on it and then I'm looking and I'm, I think, well, you idiot. <laughs> and so then I, you know, then I'm having to click twice to get to the second page of the next tune. And, um, it's it's a learning process but and the thing i noticed was also if you have a five page chart and the coda is on the page four and you have to go back to page one that also takes some thinking ahead or you know some clever tap dancing 
Uh, right. I know. It's interesting. Well, that's that's one of the few disadvantages I've found is is uh, you 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 can't you lose the ability to kind of sense where you are in the piece. Right. Because it's just this one iPad there. So if you pedal yourself into a corner like that. Yeah, I, I had I've had that happen a couple of times. I conducted for the first time with the iPad. Uh, well, pre pandemic, obviously, it was maybe 2019 or something like that. And I really enjoyed that experience because I had all the notes. In there, I had the individual parts for the musicians so I could like look at their part. It was a youth orchestra, so it's, it was helpful to say like, no, page two, line two. Um, and it was kind of cool to like always know when I look down at the stand, the music was always in the same place. You know, when you're working with a score, maybe you're looking in the upper left corner, lower right. But I did kind of worry about uh, if I if I page turned wrong or something like that, you know, it would have been fine with that group, but that's one of the few, but man, that set list feature, every event I do, I just create a new set list and then I can look back like, what did I do in 2018? Oh yeah. And I'll even save the, like the logistics sheets for certain gigs and stuff like that. It is like, that's like a perfect for me. I, there's no going back. I do miss, you know, pulling out my book and writing a couple notes in it, but I, I do that with my Apple pencil and it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. And, and, you know, I'm seeing that trend now. I don't know how, how, how about for you, um, if you're seeing more and more musicians on gigs do that, but I've noticed I usually am doing bass stuff, but I was the only person with an iPad. And then all of a sudden, a couple other people did. And back at the last bass convention, I was, everybody had an iPad out almost on stage. Have you been seeing that with other instrumentalists also? Uh, with a few, yeah. Not, they're still, yeah, paper-only people that, who I see. You know, and the, they always have comments about the iPad, you know, what if you run out of batteries, you know, what if it, you know, freezes on you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have yet to have, but I, so many people are going all in. Dennis Whitaker of the Houston Grand Opera, he and his stand partner decided to go all iPad for the opera. And and he said the only the only snafu they ever had is he forgot the iPad one day. <laughs> so then they, they had, had to get the librarian to bring out some parts. But they even have the sepia tone they put on, and I think they have a maybe a, a new iPad or a battery pack or something like that. But apparently that they're... It, it works great for them. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, so how is how is uh, not to chat on endlessly about the pandemic because everyone's probably sick of it. But like, how how are things in Cologne? I mean, like here in San Francisco, nothing's open. It's just as closed as it was a year ago. It sounds like at least some gigs are happening to some extent. How, how are things? Well. Uh, at the, the WDR, the radio and TV station where I play with the big band, we're still rehearsing and producing and everything is a live stream. So uh, they were nice enough. They gave us a trio concert last Saturday night uh, with just the rhythm section from the big band. This next Saturday, we're performing with in the Philharmonic Hall with a live stream with local Cologne composers. Um, so we're, our studio is big enough that we can kind of distance a little, you know, as much as we should, two meters between each instrument and still rehearse. Um, and then we go into these halls and, and do our live streams. That said, none of the restaurants are open. They just let the schools open again this week. Uh, a lot of businesses are really suffering the hotels the hairdressers all the restaurants uh they're all just shut down so um i'm really lucky we're fortunate as musicians that we can still do these live streams because they they say there's no concerts with an audience you know the, uh, you can't have any audience at any concert no matter what size the venue or what you know distancing you have so things are, are limping along. And also the, uh, the vaccine rollout here has been less uh, impressive <laughs> than their, their lockdown was very impressive. The vaccine rollout was not so impressive. So we're still waiting. They've done the over 80, 80 year old people now. And we're, you know, hopefully that'll trickle down to others. Okay. Soon. 
Okay, that's good. Yeah. Well, we're we're uh, yeah. We're, we're, here in the states, we're about as bad at this pandemic stuff as you can get. We're, we're at least starting to get the vaccine. Now, my wife's in healthcare, so she's gotten it. But we're uh, the one of the advantages, I guess, to living in California is that uh, it's pretty nice out all the time, and so they have outdoor dining is open, and there've been and musicians are starting to play outside again. And I'll tell you, the the people are so thirsty for music. You would not believe how many people. And the, there's this. Uh, a van that drives around called the Bay Area Jazzmobile and they come and they set up in the park in my neighborhood and they play in all the cafes around the square people are watching and that you know everybody's wearing masks and all that stuff but eating some food or having a drink and it's like, like you can just see the the thirst for connection that people have so uh, hopefully if that's any indication uh, once concerts start happening again I'll be, I know I'm going to go to every concert I possibly can <laughs> probably for the rest of my life because I, 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 I just think back to a year ago and I was like subbing in the San Francisco Symphony and which I never take for granted but you know I, I was just like and and and, try, and the last gi- I remember the last gig I played you know with, with my bass like about a year ago and then it's just you know I'm definitely not taking any of that for granted once we yeah. can get back to it but, yeah if well not if but when everything opens up when we can have real concerts again I think People are so starved for the contact and for the culture and just the vibe and the yeah social atmosphere that it, there's going to be a huge boom. Yeah, so. I'm pretty confident in that having seen we you know we had uh, we we had, back in November th- it was kind of this scene where you could d- do things outside and then California clamped everything down for about two months and and just seeing that th- how depressing that became for a couple months and now that it's open up again like if a- any indication my on scientific research here in San Francisco it looks like yeah people are are going crazy wanting to have some concerts and experiences like that. Right. And yeah. I, I've heard in California that the they're short vaccines now or the. Yeah, we're, we're bad at everything over here in the in the states and in California. Yeah, they're short then they're but they are rolling out. So, you know, I'm, I'm probably the last I'm the lowest priority demographic. So I'll probably I'll probably get it sometime in 2021, maybe. But but it's it, all the healthcare folks are getting it. The teachers are getting it. Uh, senior citizens are getting it in some capacity. So, um, yeah. Slowly but surely. Right. John, right. I'll, I'll link up to the course. I'll link up to your site. I'll link up to our other chats and just send folks to every, uh, every anything else you want me to send people to or. Um... Um, no, it's uh, I mean, I could send you a link to the trio concert from last weekend. Just sure. Facebook link. Uh, maybe that that might be interesting for somebody, but cool. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the the support and the contact and the help. John, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for coming back. I always learn a lot whenever I talk to John. And check out that course that's linked up to in the show notes or just go to discoverdoublebase.com and you will find it along with a whole bunch of other courses from John. Hey, from me. And I've got a new one coming out with Discover Double Base that we will be announcing details of soon. I can't believe that that was over a year ago. (laughs) What a year. Uh, But we're not going to talk about the past year right now because I need to get out of the house and go stretch the legs and take the dog and go with the wife and hang out on the waterfront for a little bit. This is episode three of four when I record these and sit down and do them and batch them. And if you listen to these outros, you probably know that's what I do. Uh, so I'm going to be briefer than normal here. But if you do want to reach out, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com will put you in touch with me. And though I'm in a hurry now, I'm not always. <laughs> and I love reading messages from people. So feel free to let me know any guest suggestions or topic ideas or just say hi. That would be great. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, Trevor Jones, and Krista Copper. Theme music by Eric Hochberg with me fiddling around in G minor up top. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm.